so I want to talk real briefly about how to survey, how to find this. So uh, Scott mentioned that we need your help. Uh, we can't cover uh, all the water bodies at once. Uh, the Nature Conservancy did initiate a project this year with Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to, uh, to monitor as quickly and rapidly as possible over 400 boat launches uh, through New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. So we're we're getting there, but uh, we certainly need your help. And so, how are you going to how are you going to look in your waterways and your water bodies for hydrilla? Uh, the first thing you, you want to do is figure out how you're going to do that. What method or technique are you going to pick? And there's a couple of different techniques. You can use visual surveys. Uh, you can do kind of a shoreline assessment. Just kind of look and see what you see in the shallow waters or what's washing up on the beach. Or you can do a rake toss method, and I'll describe those methods in more detail in a second. Uh, and then you want to figure out where you're going to do this, uh, the best and easiest for you. We want to want as much information as as possible, so whatever's going to get you outside um, and and do this, I think that's that's really what we're shooting for here. So, so the easiest might be outside your dock, along the shoreline, at the beach, at the boat launch, uh, at your favorite fishing cove. So that might be an option. If you're you're really scientific and you want to, um, you can do uh, grids or transects. So you can kind of lay out a grid system in a in a lake or a section of a lake or or river, a big river, and and do grids and from there do rake tosses. But really, we want uh, as many locations as possible. Uh, want as much data and information as possible, and choose the method that's going to work best for you. And the, really, really want the the documentation of this. So. Um, if you don't find anything, that's great, and we want to know about that, and, and more to, on that to come. So shoreline visual surveys, this, this might be uh, an easy way to, to get out there if you don't want to get on the water, uh, you're at the beach, at an area, so where you're going to focus on hot spots. You're going to focus on spots that you think uh, you may find aquatic plants. Uh, this could be areas near boat launches, near shallower waters, near inlets and outlets. Uh, maybe that area of a water body that uh, a lot of debris collects, uh, plants, um, driftwood, things like that. Those might be good areas to focus on. And when doing that and looking around, you want to find what's washing up on the, the shore, what's washing up on the beach. And you can use you know, either a long rake or a net to, to grab plants that are floating out there that you can't reach from shore. Uh, and you want to see whether or not that plant is is a fragment that's, that's floating, is it in a bed, is it still attached, and is it a large bed uh, attached to the substrate. And again, document. So you, if you have a GPS on your boat or on your watch or phone or what have you, uh, you can, can take that point. Um, if you don't have that, and, and hopefully you, you do know where you are and you can mark that on a map when you get back home or, or at your home and, and uh, mark that location that you assessed that and found certain plants that may be suspicious and f uh, require further investigation. And how to do that, uh, we would collect some photographs, and I'll describe that in a second as well. Another thing that you can do is, is uh, while out in the water, um, in your boat, uh, abiding by all uh, New York State uh, boating safety regulations and laws, uh, you can look in shallow water. Um, you don't want to go too, too deep, so 3 to 12 feet is a good average. If you go over 20, 25 feet, that's probably getting a little bit too deep. But again, focus on areas that are near boat launches, near where there's lots of people, shallower waters, inlets, outlets, the, the favorite fishing cove, things like that. And if you want to do this on a day where if you don't have like a spotting scope uh, in the boat, lower right-hand corner of the, the slide here, uh, that is kind of help you see to the bottom. If you don't have that, uh, you can buy those. You can make one, or you can just wait for early morning or, or late afternoon, evening, when water's still uh, and you have a good pair of sunglasses on and you can see to the bottom. And so you want to collect and see what, uh, what again, looks suspicious. Uh, you can use a rake to kind of dip that into the water when you're finding something uh, that, that looks suspicious uh, and identify that those plants. Again, document where you're doing this, where you uh, have done these visual assessments, either through GPS or estimating that location and water depths on, on a map or even just in a notebook. And again, if you do collect things, collect digital photographs and take those photographs. Now, uh, 
a very good method of, of uh, doing some surveys too is is through the rake toss method. And, and anyone can do this, uh, again, from virtually anywhere. All you need is, is a couple of rakes. And you can go to the hardware store, cut off the, the heads of the rakes, uh, and have the teeth face away from each other so that they can collect on both sides, whatever side the rake lands. And you can attach it by zip ties or rope, or uh, if you're really, really handy, you can weld it together, uh, attach mm -hmm. some rope to it, um, and at the top of the rope, you may want to put some sort of flotation device, like a water noodle, in case uh, in case you let go of the rope, you can at least retrieve it. Um, and then all these things kind of are, are good ID tools to, to have with you if you're doing this, but especially in the boat, because you're going to be pulling in a lot of stuff if you're doing the rake toss. Uh, plastic tray to help kind of float plants and see how they, they uh, look when wet, because things do look different when you pull them out of the water. Uh, hand lenses to really see those serrations, even though you can see them uh, with the naked eye. Ziploc baggies are very good for collecting plants. You can just put some lake water in there and, and float the plants and freeze it um, for, for later if you need to, to uh, send it on. Uh, and then the GPS for uh, marking points. And again, when doing this, you can either focus on the hot spots, those aquatic beds, or you can get very scientific and rigorous and do 100 meter increments along a shoreline, you can divvy up the, a lake into grids and do points along that. Uh, but again, whatever is best for you. And what you want to do with the rake toss. Uh, so Bob is, is holding the rake in the, the upper right. Uh, you want to go to that location that you're going to do it, whether or not it's at the end of your dock or um, as you're sipping a martini and uh, floating around. Uh, you can, can do this wherever. So. You go to that point, mark that point, document it, and uh, throw the rake uh, into the water. And you let it settle to the bottom. Uh, so that's why you don't want to do it too deep of water. Again, like 3 to 12 feet is, is, is best. And retrieving the rake, you want to kind of let it drag along the bottom of uh, the water body and very slowly pull it towards the boat. Uh, you want to do that extremely slowly because you don't want to dislodge any of the plants that do get tangled up into the tines. Now, at some times you may pull in uh, nothing. Um, and you may not get any plants on there, and and that's fine. Again, document that. Let uh, document that in your notebook or or phone or whatever uh, system that you will be using. Um, at other times, you may have difficulty pulling in the rake, and uh, because it's so full with with vegetation. And when you get that that point where you do have a lot of vegetation, you do want to sift through it. You don't want to just take one glance at it and say it's all one particular thing because aquatic invasive species can become really intertwined. And so you kind of want to sift through it and pull it as almost like kind of pulling apart cotton candy. So you want to kind of go through that and look to see the different types of plants within that. And if you do find things, again, that look like they could be hydrilla, uh, go through the the, the protocols that Bob talked about, but you want to collect it, uh, photograph it, and record that, that data. If you are finding something and you have an opportunity to, to collect it by hand, um, the more of the whole plant, the better. A, a one-inch plant fragment, though you can, can get to uh, some identification, really having a, a good chunk of, of the plant is <laughs> best. Uh, and also, you don't need to collect uh, five to ten pounds of anything. It's you know a few strands of the particular plant that that is in question. But you want to collect any flowers that might be there, though they're they're kind of uh, non-distinct. You want to collect the whorls again from both the top and, and bottom of the plant. And if possible, as Bob mentioned, you want to grab the tuber. So that's the thing that's going to be in the sediment. So that's where if you can can get into the water, you want to kind of reach down and, and grab some sediment, shake it off, and, and see if you, you do have a, a tuber there. And photographing. So this can is often best done indoors because you can control the lighting and, and background environments. Uh, photographing plants is, is difficult. And, and as mentioned, too, aquatic plants do look different when you pull them out of the water. So if, if possible, you can kind of float them in, in a tray um, with a white background, as you, as you see here. And we really want up-close photos, uh, again, as you see here. You don't want kind of a, a landscape view of, of what you're seeing. We want really kind of up-close because uh, we want to see the whorls, want to see if there's serrations on the leaves. 
um, and that's really what's going to going to help the identification and whether or not more more data is going to need to be collected. So that's uh, that's how to do that. And again, you want to document and, and label the particular plant that you're seeing or think you're seeing, the date, location um, on that particular background in that photo. So uh, that's on the, the monitoring side, and, and uh, as we transition over to uh, Meg Wilkinson from New York Natural Heritage Program, do have a, another question here. Which part of the hydrilla plant is the best distinguishing characteristics? 